The markets are wild right now. You've most likely seen the headlines about how the S&P 500 is continuing to smash all-time highs. And this is even more so true when you just consider the technology sector, which is continuing its record-breaking run, mostly due to a hype around artificial intelligence. But here's the thing, we've been here more than once, and the most dangerous words in investing are, it's different this time. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the record-breaking growth of the technology sector and compare it to the overall market to give us insight to where we truly stand. And then to get us out of all this sector discussion, we'll take a look at a fascinating company that has gotten a ton of scrutiny this past week. And that company is of course CrowdStrike, which made headlines when a faulty software update triggered a widespread Microsoft outage. This faulty update affected approximately 8.5 million Windows devices globally and caused significant disruptions across multiple sectors, including air travel, healthcare, broadcasting, financial services, and critical infrastructure. The stock is down 28%. Perhaps there's some potential here, especially when you consider tech's historic gains. Let's dive in. So there's absolutely no question that the market has soared to levels of irrational exuberance. And we can prove this. One of investors' favorite tools for gauging current valuations is called the Schiller P.E. Ratio, which was invented by Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller. And if we take a look at that indicator, we can see that it's currently sitting around 35.3, with lots of momentum going up. We've been at these levels before, twice actually. Well, at least two times on the way up, four times if you consider the way down. And the last time the Schiller P.E. ratio was at this level was back in January of 21, at the height of the ZERP phase, or zero interest rate policy phase. And it was the last time we saw the meme stock frenzy. And the other time before that was in January of 98, which was the height of the internet-led dot-com boom and eventual bust. So that's it, right? Uh, end of story. The market is overvalued and we should stay away from stocks at all costs right? Well, that's what's so baffling about all of this. While the market is cruising high, perhaps too high, it's only being led by seven companies. And those are, of course, the tech-focused Magnificent Seven, which had their breakout in 2023, as seen here, where they pummeled the S&P 500's gain of 24%. The Magnificent Seven's worst performer of 2023 was Apple, and it still doubled the market. And the rally has continued on into 2024 with the Magnificent Seven as a whole more than doubling the S&P 500. So could this mean that a bubble is forming in the Magnificent Seven, but the rest of the market is trading at relatively normal levels? Yeah, kind of. An article that came out in January of 24 stated that the forward P ratio of the S&P 493, basically the S&P 500 minus the Magnificent Seven, is just around 15.5. And the Magnificent Seven has a forward P ratio of 35, which is much, much more concerning. It's also important to note that forward P ratio is different than the Schiller P ratio we just mentioned. The reason is a bit nerdy and beyond the scope of this video, but if anyone asks in the comments section, I'll be more than happy to explain it. The overall punchline is just like what we said in the opening of this video, the most dangerous words in investing are it's different this time. Here's legendary investor Peter Lynch way back in 1997, which was right before the start of the internet stock boom and eventual bust. Well, we had a huge run. I mean, the market was 4,000 just, you know, two and a half years ago. Yeah. And it ran up to 8,300 in August. And, you know, like any big rally, sometimes it backs off. I mean, it's healthy. In fact, I mean, I'd rather have gone down 1,000 points than gone to 12,000. If the market goes too high, you're discounting earnings seven, eight, ten years out. And so everything is overpriced. Yeah, and that doesn't help anything. The market since World War II has sold between 10 times earnings and 20 times earnings. If you look at the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, if you add up all the companies and take the earnings, you say there's a relationship. And it follows. McDonald's earnings have been terrific the last 30 years, and the stock's been terrific. There's a direct relationship. So the earnings of the S&P 500 have been between this range of 10 and 20. We were just about to go over the 20, which is the high end of the PE range. There wasn't a lot so of room left PE on the PE of 20 is, too, is, is at the, the top peak. of high high. So there it is. If we don't take into account the Magnificent Seven right now, we're actually not too far out of normal territory, but the Magnificent Seven is hot at 35 times future earnings. Their valuations are so high that three very prestigious firms, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, and Sequoia, 
have all issued warnings about big tech's bubble-like behavior. And the crux of all of these articles is that big tech has been pouring billions of dollars into generative AI and not showing the results necessary to justify that investment, at least today. For instance, Microsoft's capital expenditures, or CapEx, is up 79% year over year. Google's is up 91%. And Amazon just bought a nuclear powered data center to try and keep up with their compute costs for AI. To justify this massive spending, investors need to start seeing results. And so far, all of this investment hasn't produced the additional revenue for big tech. We're entering into earnings seasons now, and Google reported a mediocre quarter. They beat revenue by a half percent and earnings per share by just over 2%. And this doesn't justify the massive investments that they're making. And the stock is being punished. It's down almost 5% today. And the rest of big tech is also starting to feel the burn. At the time of this recording, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, and Apple are all starting to flutter. There is no question in my mind that AI is a complete game changer, but the real effects of it are going to take longer than we expect. It will take longer than most people anticipate, and that's very likely. Sometimes things just takes time, and nobody has a crystal ball when it will happen. Uh, then it might create some disappointment, and we saw that with the dot-com boom and bust, that all the promises of mid-90s did come to fruition, but it just took longer than people thought. This effect has a name, and understanding it is imperative to shielding ourselves from getting caught up not only in this hype cycle, but also future hype cycles. And that law is called Amera's Law. It states that while we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run, we underestimate the effect of that technology in the long run. The initial promise of the internet did come true, but that didn't prevent investors from pouring billions of dollars into the market only to not get the immediate results that they were expecting, and the market came tumbling down in one of the worst financial disasters in history. So I actually don't think it's big tech that's making the mistake here. They have no control over their stock price. It's us as investors. Realistically, individual investors only make about 20% of the market, so it's really the institutional investors. But that's also part of our advantage as individual investors. But anyway, I'm digressing. Big tech is playing it smart. They are looking years into the future and making the necessary investments to stay competitive in the age of AI. They are playing the long game. Who is at fault here are the investors who are bidding up big tech stock prices to these insane levels. But this also presents an opportunity because while I do think that there will be a Magnificent 7 crash, and I'm not in the business of predicting markets, I can just see the alarm bells. I don't know if it'll be next week or next year, but it is coming. So all of this means that in my opinion, we should stay away from big tech right now. But as we saw, the rest of the market may have opportunities. So that's the groundwork we all need to be aware of about the state of big tech currently. But the fun part of investing is getting into the specific company analysis, which is what we'll bust into right now. Okay, just as the market overhypes things in the short run, it will also oversell things. I like to look at businesses when they get smashed overnight, and this is definitely the case with CrowdStrike. But no intelligent investor can talk about a stock without first understanding their business model, which is really just understanding how that business makes money. And CrowdStrike is pretty simple here. They make money by subscription for their flagship product called Falcon. Coincidentally, Falcon is also the software that got the update that caused so many computers to crash last week. CrowdStrike is able to stand out from legacy cybersecurity companies because of a new approach that they're taking where they are trying to think and operate like attackers. They employ hundreds of red teams who are basically trying to hack into everything and they build their solution around what their red teams are able to break into. It's a really brilliant idea. And there's no question that their business has been greatly rewarded for this innovative approach. They've seen revenue grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 78% over the last seven years. Just last year, revenue grew 36% and net income grew 148%. These are their annual growth numbers. Their quarterly is even more impressive. However, I do like this annual view because it shows that revenue growth is slowing down. So the key question here is, will the company be able to continue to grow into the future? And finding that is sort of hard. In their annual report, they outline a few ways that they can continue to grow. And those reasons include an increasing sophistication and disruption of cybersecurity threats. 
basically the market overall is growing. And second, an expanded attack service driven by hybrid and remote workforces. I thought that was really interesting. They're basically saying that there's more room for people to attack with more distributed devices. And then they also say that there's a growing cyber skills gap as things get more complex. And to simplify security operations, they need to reduce complexity. What they're basically trying to get at is the environment's getting too complicated and there's too many attacks, especially since AI is online now, for security to be a manual process. They're saying that there will be an increased need for software to protect systems. Overall, analysts are expecting the market for cybersecurity companies to expand between 10 and 14% per year from now until 2029. So if the overall pie is expanding at 14%, and CrowdStrike is able to just grow at that rate, then we will see top line sales continue to slow down. But clearly the market is anticipating way more than that. Even after their recent pullback, the stock is trading at an insane 495 times earnings. This is crazy, but they are growing earnings really quickly. From their most recent earnings report back in April, they were able to grow net income 8,600% year over year and on a quarterly basis. So we would expect them to continue to grow that PE over time. And they say multiple times in their annual report that they take a land and expand approach to business. But I simply cannot justify that PE ratio with sales slowing down this much. All of this coupled with the fact that their CEO is set to testify in front of Congress means the stock probably has a lot of room to fall. So while it definitely was worth taking a look, I will definitely pass on this one for the time being. And that's completely okay, because just as Peter Lynch said in that same Charlie Rose interview. You have to look at 20 to find one. It's just, you don't you know, go to the mall and find the stock. I mean, you have to say, my God, this sounds like it's good. And then you have to do some steps. You have to do an organized method. People are careful when they buy a toaster. Careful, they're careful when they buy a seat. They do, they do yeah, some research. Yeah. But they don't do it with stock. They it's call up the broker or they see somebody at lunch and they say, man, I got this hot stock. Yep. And you run right out and you spend $5,000, yeah, small yeah. investors. Yep. Or they, even worse, they put an option in the international data whack. They don't even own international data whack. So they have a 90 day play. <laughs> but it's Bill like said it was good and they make a lot of money. Right, right. And it's like, and it's like a casino. Yeah. So it's like a casino. You get the same results as if there's more paperwork. And fortunately for us, there are tons of other stocks in tech that I have my eye on, like Airbnb and Uber. And there are tons of other companies still worth exploring. So it's okay that we don't buy everything that we take a look at. That is completely normal in investing. And it's honestly what the greatest investors of all time do. I wrote full analysis on this section, understanding the business of CrowdStrike on our flank investing platform, and also the other sections that we didn't have time to get into, like analyzing if CrowdStrike has a moat or understanding their management. Fun fact, their CEO also drives race cars in his spare time. There's a link to our Patreon in the description. By signing up, you'll get early access to that flank platform, which offers you that systemized approach to investing that Peter Lynch just mentioned. It's entirely based on his and Warren Buffett's style of investing. You'll also get to meet with me one-on-one -on -one to discuss which companies you're researching. The Patreon membership is currently $10 a month. You'll also get to meet with me one-on-one -on -one to discuss any type of questions you have with Buffett style analysis and also just to discuss which companies you're researching. This helps me make sure that we're building the right site to accomplish Flank's mission, to tangibly reduce the wealth gap by empowering individual investors and restoring stakeholder capitalism. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.